Okay, so, um, you know, we were, some of us were talking a little bit earlier, um, not about anything too serious, but this is the topic of our evening. Um, so one of the, the really strange things about this research is essentially what it is, is I studied bird hunting and I'm a vegetarian, like my entire life vegetarian. <laughs> so, so it's, you know, you're hearing it from a weird source, but when I got to the master's level, in college and my, my teacher asked me what I wanted to do for my thesis, it seemed like the logical choice. Um, not a lot had been done regarding bird catching. The bird catchers themselves, you know, these, these people, I don't have anything written directly by a bird catcher and that probably says something. Um, it's always somebody who was sitting there with them and wrote it down, never themselves. It, that, they were really country people. They, they were spent months sometimes up in the forest where nobody else ever goes. Like even now, nobody knew the forest like them, probably nobody ever will any, ever again. And I, these are the only two bird catchers that I actually have any kind of picture of. Uh, from Ka'u, he died in the 1850s, but passed on a lot of his knowledge to a man named Kenoi who actually was living in this Ahupua'a. Uh, right now we're in the Ahupua'a of Keoho right on the edge. Um, so Kinoi learned a lot from his father-in-law, Kiave Ehu, and passed that knowledge down um, and taught us today a lot. And then this other guy here, who we have a photograph of, his name is um, Reverend Henry Nalimu. He was from, born in Northern Hilo, uh, lived down where Wailua Park is right now. And he was of Ali'i blood. So that, that haircut he has, that kind of cool haircut, is called uh, Akopo'o O'u. It's the, the head of an O'u bird, yeah. <laughs> and he was actually blind when this picture was taken. He, he went blind in his old age. But real knowledgeable guy. He died in the 1830s, 98 years old. Was born in the 1830s. Distribution of the birds on this island. So we're talking about the, how we can learn things about their population, yeah, from this kind of, this kind of research. So what this map shows um, is where, where bird catching was happening on this island. So there, all the black there, you see the black? That's catching birds um, for meat. So things like nene, uwa'u, which is the Hawaiian petrel, uh, a couple of other species as well. And the gray is catching for, um, for forest birds, for feather work. Um, obviously where we have that checkery kind of pattern happening, we're doing both. And that's actually, Kapapala is the big one and Kioho is, is that, that district that we're in right now. So. We're in a special place. Now, what do we use to catch the birds? Plants, actually. Um, a lot of people talk about Pisonia, which is Papala Ke Pao, a plant we have in the park. It has a very sticky seed that you could use to, to go and catch the birds. Um, probably it was not used directly, just like I take the seed and then I put it on a branch and the bird jumps on it. It, it seems like there was a recipe for it. I know for certain that with these two plants, um, Ohavai, Clermontia, and Ulu, um, breadfruit, uh, we used a recipe to cook them down. And guess who gave us that recipe? Actually, no. It was, it was Nalimu via Theodore Kelsey. He told Theodore Kelsey. Theodore Kelsey wrote down very good notes. And then Noah read those notes and decided, hey, let's try it. So that's what you see over there. Um, I made myself some, some kepao, some bird catching lime. And it looks like a little green booger. Um, <laughs> so... So what happens with it, I realized when I tried to make it, is the reason why you make, you boil it down, because, um, so this is, this is breadfruit sap that I was boiling down, mixed with a couple of other things. If you've ever touched breadfruit sap, it's very, very sticky, extremely sticky. What happens when you boil it down is it loses a little bit of that stickiness, but it becomes much more elastic. So you can spread it. You can spread it on top of something. Um, and it comes off with oil. Um, the ancestor of one of my friends, taught um, Elizabeth, not Elizabeth, Isabella Iona Abbott um, when she was a little girl, how to, um, you know, that was her family too, how to take bird, bird lime off of a, of a bird and you wipe oil on it, it comes off, it really does. I tried it with vegetable oil, works, so that's pretty cool. Um, Dr. Moniz Nakamura, the, who also works here at the park, took a picture of this, this is a bird catching stick um, of a particular kind, the kind used to catch to catch baby chicks in their burrows, like the uwa'u, that bird that my ancestors were, ke were catching. You take that twisty stuff, you put some sap on it, shove it inside of the, the burrow that has the baby, twist it around, all into the baby's fur, pull it out, and that's how you get them, because these burrows are long. 
well, one way you can get them. The other thing here is uh, kia manu. Um, that, that is a bird catching stick you use for, for, for the forest birds. So it's really long. You have the main pole itself. You have the kihele, which is letter B there. And that's used to secure it onto a tree when you stick it up into the tree. Longer than these. Um, D is called a kano. If you're going to use a decoy bird, like if you wanted a if you wanted to, to stick a, another bird in there so that the other birds come and say, hey, who's that in my tree? Go get away, and they try and chase that other bird, you'll put it on the connel. So that's, that's a real good way of, of catching birds because, like I said, they're kind of bullies, right? Um, and then the top there is called a lalua. And if you're going to put bait like flowers or berries or whatever for them to want to come, that's where you put it is on the lalua. So cool. Oh, and, and then, you know, the Volcano Art Center was very kind. That, the artists there were very kind. They let me use this photo um, painting that they made. You can kind of see the, you see the bird catcher there? He's going to go in like this. He's sticking his, his thing way into the tree. So it's a good visual for us. I just stuck that in this evening. Um, so thank you, Volcano Art Center. Um, and here is the Kolea. This is actually in our collection here at the National Park. We have an archival collection here, you know. And it's actually accessible to the public if you make a request. Just FYI, apparently nobody ever asks. Uh, <laughs> I think it's because nobody knows. So um, this stone, this kolea stone, the, the, is used in a method called hawa. And what hawa is, is you take the stone with a groove on it, you tie a string to it, you take that wooden stake there, you plug it into a little grub or something like that that the kolea is going to want to eat, and then you, um, you lay it out there in the field, and you go and hide. And the kolea is going to come, he's going to say, wow, look at that fat grub, I want to eat that. He eats it. Now the fat grub is on that that steak there. So guess what happens when he eats it? He swallows the steak and then it gets stuck in his throat. But the steak, it's tied to the stones. This is animal cruelty here. We could never do this today. <laughs> um, um, but it gets tied. To, it, it's stuck there because the, the stone weighs him down. So you can go dash out. You can grab him, wring its neck. Um, it's, this is, I wouldn't be surprised if there's still people alive who have done this, um, especially in Waimea which is where this stone comes from. Uh, but I don't think anybody does it today. And I've talked to people who have tried kolea before. Don't go killing kolea. They're protected and they're important birds. They eat a lot of bad things. But they're, they're, they're supposed to be really, really rich. Like, so you catch them when they start turning color like this, yeah? It's called kapule. So when you, because they're fat, right? So you catch them then and you eat them. It's the kind of richness that you want to eat more but man, this is too rich. I feel like I'm going to get the runs or something if I eat another one. So it's, it's a really good eating bird, apparently. Um, and they used to be extraordinarily abundant. We're talking like flocks of hundreds of birds back in the day. They're still pretty common. But when you hear that there were flocks of hundreds of them and they were caught by the hundreds back in the old days with that method, it tells you that things have changed, yeah? So um, nets were also used. This is a bird catching net in Bishop Museum. They don't know exactly how it's used, but there are various methods that involve setting up um, nets and calling to the uwa'u as they fly into their nests at night. And the uwa'u, see the guy standing there behind the rock? That's, that's my beautiful art. Um, he's saying, where, where? Uwa'u hears the, the person calling and he thinks, hey, there's other uwa'u over there. I should totally go hang out with them. He flies down, gets stuck in the net, and then you catch him. The flavor of uwa'u, which is an endangered species again, so don't go eating them. <laughs> Um, it's said to be like nothing else, part fish and part bird. The best tasting bird in all of Hawaii is what they say. Um, it's not very clear whether or not adults were eaten. We, there, chicks are famous for being eaten as being a favorite food for the chiefs. I strongly suspect that um, the birds that were caught with nets like this were mostly um, juveniles who were not super smart or maybe first year birds who are not necessarily nesting yet um, because of the way certain information is presented in, in these, these documents and also because it, it's not too smart to go and kill all the adult birds that are, that are creating the eggs and um, you, want, you want that to be sustainable. Interesting thing that Dr. Nakamura found out, uh, Moni Nakamura found out about uh, about the, the uwa'u and is supported by evidence that I found is that Hawaiians were creating new nests for them. 
Uh, and so the reason why I, I, I think is partly because you want to create you want to create more habitat for the birds to come in so that you have more food, but also you're trying to concentrate the birds in one area so you don't have to walk like 10 miles to get like three uwa'u, yeah. But it was something that was being done, and it's, it's, it's interesting. So Ikea Kalkini, this particular chant, um, performed here by Palea Kuluvaimaka, the last of the court chanters of King Kalakaua, um, is a chant honoring ali'i, honoring chiefs. It describes catching the chief catching birds um, out on the cliffs in the mist um, near Waipio and Waimanu in Kohala. So, no. um, so he was a master chanter, so we're, we're very fortunate to have his, his recordings. So one of the things that people also tend to say about birds in Hawaii is that Hawaiians would catch the birds, pluck the feathers, and then release them. Is that true? Well, yes and no. So like so many things in life, it's been oversimplified. It's, it's not quite that simple. So a lot of people, when they talk about that, they'll say, well, Kamehameha told his bird catchers to do that. That's Kamehameha, right? Kamehameha the Great. But when you look at the actual Hawaiian language version of what he said in Kamakau, he says specifically to his bird catchers, release the o'o birds once you catch them. And remember, the o'o birds, the most important feathers are what? The yellow ones, which are called e'e. I remembered, see? I told you. E'e. <laughs> uh, and if, if you're removing the e'e, the birds can survive. They're going to be kind of pissed, but they can survive. Um, and oh, we're actually known for being very wary, and that's probably because of, of this catch and release thing. So, but if you're catching like an eevee, I wish, or let's say in the rare case, you're catching something like this, Mr. Apapane, you know, it takes a ton of birds to make a keep, like ridiculous amounts of birds to make a keep, tens of thousands. And it's a slow process. If you're a good bird catcher, you might catch about 30 in a day. So you catch, you catch your eevee or your apapane, how many feathers are you taking? Are we just going to pull two feathers and then let them go? <laughs> not if you're not if you're you're smart and you, you don't want your king to kill you. Um, plus, if you're just pulling like two feathers, you don't know if it's the same bird you caught five minutes ago, right? So, most most of the time with these red birds, what they would do is they would kill them and they would skin them and they keep the whole skin. Um, sometimes you can even look into the capes and you'll see the skin sewed in. They didn't. Usually you tie the feathers in, but there are some capes out there where they literally sewed skins in. And um, that's just easier that way. Um, and it's, I think it's smart. So, you know, we, what we can learn from, from this about, for, you know, for us who are Hawaiian, we can learn that we don't have to look at the past through a rosy lens. They were who they were. They did these things, but they did them for a reason. They were practical, yeah? They did it for a reason. They were not wasteful people. They took those, those bird bodies and they ate them. I mean, it's a tiny little bird. It's like two bites. But if you have 30 of them, it's not so bad, right? That's actually a meal. And protein up in the mountains, that's, that's hard to come at, after. So the, the answer is yes and no. They released the o'o. They killed many of the others. 